This is a lecture really about the, the concept of gender discourse as it relates to Othello. Gender discourse is really the idea, what well, discourse itself I suppose is, is the idea that certain concepts continue to flow through our society and our texts and our social narrative and when people talk to them they add to this on uh, this ongoing discussion or when they write about them. And we call that ongoing discussion about a particular idea or ideology or concept or issue um, discourse. So when we talk about the idea of gender discourse, we're talking about the ongoing discussion about gender and how we understand it. And when we can think about it in relation to a text, well, First, I suppose there are three elements to, to think about. One is the idea of contemporary discourse and kind of like where we are at in our current discussion. And then you can think about the idea of the evolution of discourse, how things have arguably changed over time, back to the specifics of the gender constructs at the time in which the text was produced, which may or may not actually precede the idea of gender discourse, and in the case of studying Othello, it does. There was no gender discourse. There was no, uh, in, in the way we understand it now, there was no discourse of gender because the roles were more clearly defined in a way that was regarded um, in more absolute terms. The thought that gender identity was something that could or would or should evolve was a thinking that really didn't make its way into literary, intellectual, cultural or societal thinking probably until the 18th century. So, at least, potentially even the 19th. So, when we talk about gender discourse, we are talking about the discussion we're having right now and then we're starting to think about the text Othello in those terms, with an acknowledgement that the terms where, on which we're, we're talking about these issues now didn't exist at the time the text was produced. So if we think about Othello, one of the most important things in regards to gender discourse, I think, is that through an evolution of the understanding of how gender roles have changed and an increased awareness of just how patriarchally restrictive the gender roles in our society are, we're better able to appreciate some of the motivations, attitudes, choices and consequences uh, for the characters in the play. I don't think when the play was written that the majority of people would see the play as starkly as we can as something that where, where the, the, the real tragic uh, events of the text can be so clearly traced to some really problematic understandings of gender. Because if we look at Othello, and we have talked about this, this idea that Othello's manhood is an incredibly important part of his sense of self. He regards himself, he is a warrior, he's an outsider, he's a man who sees himself as redeemed from slavery. He has won, interesting choice of word, he has won Brabantio's daughter, this jewel, this pearl, this incredible creature that he has given his love and his soul to. And he is, as a, as a Venetian outsider, his worth is and his status is inextricably linked to his value as a soldier, as a commander and as a general, which are qualities that, you know, feats of broil and battle, a man that, you know, that nothing could shake, all of this sort of stuff, very closely aligned with, I suppose, alpha male, even sort of hyper alpha male stereotypes, this, this sense of great physical, mental and emotional strength. So for Othello, his identity is very closely aligned with, with these features. And because I think it has become so important for him to maintain 
that visage to maintain that role, that place in Venetian society, um, he really struggles with the sense that Desdemona's infidelity has compromised that. He finds it... He can't separate that kind of emotional pain from his sort of sense of his entire self, if you like. And when we think about Othello in relation to Iago, what we see is how consistently Iago has evoked um, gendered archetypes to further his goal of seriously deceiving Othello. Because for a start, he does two things. He, he pushes Othello to be a man repeatedly, to, to listen to the truth, to take the hard truth, and to take action, not to stand for being cuckolded, not to, not to show weakness, if you like. And he consistently ingratiates himself with Othello through presenting himself as a figure of, of real support, being that ancient, he's kind of this sort of uh, advisor, he, this sort of close advisor figure. And because Othello feels kind of like an outsider, he perhaps clings too desperately to this one person whom he's identified as, as somebody trustworthy, uh, massively to his own detriment. And whilst Iago boosts Othello's need to affirm his masculinity, he debases women consistently. Broadly, all Venetian women, he says, are untrustworthy, sexually motivated, all of these things, and that ultimately women want to satisfy their lusts. They will deceive rather than show their real natures. No irony there. And rather than specifically tag Desdemona with that, create sufficient sufi uh, suspicion in Othello's mind for him largely to do that for himself, um, along with the, the planting of, of um, false evidence and, and a great deal of constructed misdirection. So what you get is this sense that um, women are not to be trusted. And Othello absolutely fails to break from that thinking, even though he's given great opportunity to do so from Amelia and also from Desdemona. He has come to believe that they are poisoned sources of information. Desdemona is a, um, is a subtle whore. Uh, Amelia is a simple bored. These are, therefore, he is actively choosing to take the word of a man over the word of a woman or, or women, actually, because it is more reliable, because men uh, have more substance to them. And that's this idea that it's almost like a man's quality, honour, is something that runs through the existence of a man, whereas a woman's quality, virtue, is act-dependent, if you like, whether or not, you know, whether or not she remains faithful to and obedient to the man that she has chosen or has been chosen for her or not. And because Othello is so caught up in his own pain and so committed in his belief that his own right and need to be respected and validated as a man, he is so convinced of the necessity of that to preserve his honour that he, that he sees the, the killing of Desdemona as a necessary horror. The pity of it, Iago, the pity of it. You know, he eventually says in Act 5, you know, lest she'll deceive more men, as though somehow what he is doing is an act of service. He comes to greatly, greatly, greatly rue his error. Um, and I think he believes that he has been greatly deceived and that he has done something deserved of being sent to hell, but I don't think he ever quite grasps that he, it was his own innate patriarchally defined or derived thinking that helped lead him to this 
devastating end and to the death of Desdemona, um, I think he only really sees it in terms of his own need to, to, to right a perceived wrong and the fact that he had been heavily deceived, not how that deception actually worked and played on gender-specific insecurities. Amelia is an extraordinary character, a character who can easily be misunderstood. W.H. Auden certainly misunderstood her, thinking of her as simple or silly Amelia. But, of course, he was coming at um, his understanding of the play from a far less progressed understanding of gender discourse. He far too readily failed to see her position in light in the light of patriarchal oppression and sub subjugation. He thinks that she didn't um, tell Desdemona that she'd taken the handkerchief because she was silly. No, what she was actually doing was honouring a marital pledge to be obedient. Rightly or wrongly, she put the oath she swore, which, remember, in these times was a religious sacrament, ahead of something else because she believed, you know, that's what she was supposed to, to do. I nothing but to please his fancy. So she acted in, in, a, in a morally right way in terms of the morally dubious constraints of her time. When she figured out what she did, she was beside herself with sorrow and guilt. Which is why at the end, you know, she does speak out, "'Tis proper I obey him, but not now. I die as I speak." She said what needed to be said, Iago killed her for it, but she died singing the song of Willow too, died with her mistress, a casualty of, of truth, a casualty of great misogyny, a casualty of ignorance and of arrogance. Whereas poor Desdemona, Desdemona's fate was sealed, I think, before her birth in that she was brought up to be subservient, polite, virtuous, chaste, and she was all of those things. She perceived a divided duty. She shifted her loyalty from her father to her husband, and she remained loyal to Othello to the point of his death. It's easy to wring your hands at Desdemona and think, how could she do this? By a contemporary standard of discourse, one might lead to the conclusion that she was a profoundly subjugated woman, and she was, but she was not an unintelligent woman and she was not a weak woman. The, the strength she showed came out in an act which was virtuous in the context of her time, to remain loyalty, to, to remain loyal even in the face of betrayal. She was quite saintly in that regard although it's, it's very easy to wish she had behaved differently. But to expect her to have behaved differently drastically underestimates the force of a societal's gendered constructs, and it also drastically underestimates just how difficult it can be to display strength and ultimately end up rising above uh, the challenges of a situation from a disempowered position. It's like winning a race from a handicapped position when there is no fairness to the handicap in that the weak person is pushed back behind the strong person and they're told to race and the person who was pushed to the back is criticised for not winning. It's, 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 it's a deeply unfair standard to apply. What we see, I suppose, in regards to the, these characters and the... Uh, the concept of gender discourse is that we are still on a path of growing to an understanding that, that allows us to appreciate the variant ways in which women displayed strength, the variant forms of oppression that existed in terms of gender roles within um, society, ours and Elizabethan and all the time in between. And also the extent to which the patriarchy not only cost women their lives, but was tremendously damaging for men. It was this reaching for an unviable standard 
this idea that the most important thing was to adhere to a particular kind of alpha male identity that cost a fellow his life. And let's not forget that one of the primary motivators in this play, even though we're somewhat um, in the dark as to really what drove these... We know why Iago felt jealous. He believed, you know, but um, betwixt um, my sheets, he's done mine office, this idea that his women, he, he, that Amelia had slept with both um, Othello and, and um, even Cassio. But we don't know what the root cause of that insecurity was that allowed those buttons to be pressed in him. There are several theories. None of them are conclusive. The, 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 I suppose this, this gender entitlement even it can be linked to the death of Rodrigo, even though he's not um, uh, as significant a character as the other four. It's this sense that he can continue to, to, to push and to entreat. He's been told time and time and time again, my daughter is not for thee. Well, he's kind of in stalker territory, surely, um, by contemporary standards. Um, but no, he perseveres. If we look at Iago, he, he, he's, he's not only misogynistic, he's misanthropic. And he seems to hate everything except the furthering of the self by any means necessary. That's why it's fair to regard him as sociopathic. But the fact that he is so quick to debase women and use that to his advantage, it's almost like he's pushing an incel mentality onto others to motivate them. It's doubtful that he fully believes those motivations, um, but he certainly knows their power. Um, and I think if we were to look for a contemporary corollary to the actions of Othello, we're looking at honour killings that still take place in some part of the world. The idea that the actions of a woman can shame a family or a husband or whomever to such an extent that it is right that the woman be punished um, for her transgression with death, which is um, staggering that this still occurs in some parts of the world, but before we find ourselves in situations where we're throwing stones, we should look at the appalling rates of domestic violence and random, largely random violence directed towards women in our society. And it's, we are in no position to throw stones. So that sense of male entitlement runs heavily through the play the notion that the women were subordinate is true, but that does not mean that they were weak in terms of their choices, nor does it mean they were lacking an understanding. Desdemona, yes, but she was very, very young and had been treated differently up to that point in her life, but Amelia understood. That's why her um, some of the stuff she says in Act 4 is just so important. So this is a summary of some of the key gender constructs uh, that appear in the play, and by talking about them and thinking about them, we further the discourse, really, that the role of women in society is still uncomfortably defined in proximity to the privileged position and the connected sense of entitlement and the power that is held still inequitably in the hands of men.